Tori Cruz. Welcome to my channel. If you're new, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. Please put your comments below and you can also find me on social media at Miss Tori Cruz. Tori, it is so wonderful to be able to talk to you. I can hardly wait to meet you in person when all of this quarantine is lifted. I know that you're in Scottsdale right now. How are you doing there? How is it going? I hear that you might have gotten your hair done this morning. It looks fabulous. Yes. Oh my gosh. You are right. I did get my hair done this morning. Fresh new highlights. Man, I feel like a new woman. It's like Shania Twain, you know? But <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really great down here. Um, I just moved here, I guess, almost a year ago. Oh my gosh, time flies. But yeah, it's, it's amazing. And I'm just so blessed to be where I am right now in my situation. And from a lifting of the quarantine perspective, are you, how did you use this time? Are you ready to just get going? Are you feeling excited? Were you liking being in quarantine? Tell me, tell me all the things that have been going on since we last saw each other in Vegas a couple months ago. Yes, so much has happened, like an insane amount with my business and a lot of personal reflection as well. I mean, I'm an, ex I'm an extrovert, so I definitely did not like the isolation. I love people, I love community and networking, and that's also a huge part of my company as well. But um, through this, I developed a ladies networking group. And so that right there has been my source of connection with other like-minded women and inspiring and empowering one another. We do that still every Tuesday night at 4 p.m. Pacific time. And then I also developed my podcast and started a blog during quarantine. And I launched a mini course for a positive mindset. So needless to say, there has been about 12 to 14 hours a day of work. And you know, that whole work-life balance thing that people talk about, there was none of that. It was strictly just work. And I tried to use this time as just a complete breakthrough time. And, you know, to go on to the next success once the world gets back to normal or our new normal. <laughs> totally. I think that that's what separates people from either achieving the things that they want or just always being okay with whatever is in their environment right now is the ability to use something and to not always be seeking that balance. I was actually on an interview with somebody a couple days ago and they were interviewing with our organization. And she very specifically asked, what does work-life balance look like in our company? And, I, and I'm just totally honest. I'm like, we don't believe in that term. That's not something that we know or that is part of who we are, how we would describe this culture and environment because we expect that you bring this work into your life, that this is something that is fulfilling, that it pushes you, that you see your work as something that's going to take you to the places that you want to go. If not, why are you doing it? And so she obviously did not get hired. Um, but I'd love to talk to you about just your journey. I want to take the listeners through your journey. And from the standpoint of the, the ups and the downs that you went through, give us uh, an understanding of once you left college, kind of what, what your career, what your life looked like. Yeah, so I grew up in small town Iowa, first of all, and that was where everybody knew everybody. We waved at every car that went by. The courthouse was in the middle of the town square. And so I grew up in a really, really small town. And then I went off to college at University of Iowa. And after college um, was when I, or actually during college, I started my pageant journey once I was sitting in my dorm room one day and saw an ad for Miss USA on Facebook. And I thought to myself, there's no way that I can compete at Miss USA. I played sports growing up. I got turned down on the dance team in high school. Like I had none of this girly girl, cheerleader, dancing pageantry in me. And so when I started pageantry, um, I started when I was in Iowa in the teen division. And I had no clue what I was in for. I thought I need to eat a ton of chicken and broccoli, have the best dress, have the best spray tan, and the best hair and makeup. And I thought I was going to win. Well, I had a lot to figure out, needless to say. <laughs> Tell me more about the perception versus the reality of what it really takes. Yeah, so going into it, like I said, I thought I had to have all of the external things in place and the runway walk, the, the interview, the current events, the best dress, hair, everything just perfect, right? And I think that's a lot of times what pageantry is perceived as. Like you have to be this, if you're gorgeous and you have the best of everything, then you can win. <laughs> and that's not true at all. And so what you really need is, you know, what I realized after many years of hiring all those coaches and mentors for the runway, the current events, the, you know, the hair and makeup and all of that, which did help my mindset and confidence. It wasn't until I really took a hold of my mindset and my confidence where that stuff, I was never the best 
the best runway walk. I actually, funny fact, I walk, I did the entire wrong routine the year that I won of um, the swimsuit portion of the competition. I, everybody did the same routine, go off stage, pose, smile in front of the camera. I did the wrong routine. I was so focused on like what I was doing, I guess, or my pose or my smile that I walked off stage the wrong way, went and posed. I won that year. And that goes to show you, I owned up to it. The second that I walked down those stairs and I knew I was going the wrong way, instead of being like, oh crap, like turn around. I kept going and I was confident and I stood proud of who I was and what I was doing, even though in the back of my head, I was like, um, oh my gosh, is this going to you know, hurt my, my ranking? And that year I won and I walked the wrong way off stage. So it just goes to show if you, you know, you don't have to be the best runway walk or, you know, have the best wardrobe to win and do the best. I did the whole wrong routine and I won. And so just the mindset and part in that, that moment when I started really diving into my mindset and confidence and focused on that, that was the year that I won because it just, you know, like I said, when you're confident, you own up to it, then a lot of things, a lot of things can happen. Because, yeah, there's so many different moments of confidence, right? There's from from the, from an outsider standpoint, it's like the confidence to be able to walk in that way and to be looked at. So there's there's that element of it, which I'd love to dive into a little bit. But then there's also, you know, the first few times you didn't win. And so there's the confidence, the internal work that is not in front of people. Most of it is not in front of it. It's like an iceberg, right? There's like you only see the the pageant piece is just a small portion. It's the depth of what does it take as a person to, once you don't hit the goal, continue to come back, to continue to gain the skills that you need in order to be ready for that moment that everybody sees. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it was not an overnight success by any means. That first year, you know, like I said, I went in there and I thought just because I was confident at that time, which I really wasn't looking back, um, that I was going to win. And when I played basketball in high school, you know, I look at those times and it was basketball was my main sport. That's what I, I lived by growing up. And so, but that, that was a team sport. It was not individualized whatsoever. And so, you know, I could put in the work, I could put in the time um, to make my free throws, you know, when it came time, you know, by myself. But at the end of the day, it's a team sport. And I had coaches pushing me and pushing me mentally and physically to be the strongest that I could be for basketball. Um, but I still doubted myself. And then when I started pageantry, I had that competitive nature in me. So I'm like, oh, I'm competitive. I'm going to win this thing. Like, but then I went in there and I was like, whoa, like, wait a second. These girls that were on the bus to go over to the, the theater that day for rehearsals, I remember them saying that this was their sixth time competing. And I, I literally sat back and I, it, everything inside me not to laugh because I'm like, give it up. <laughs> like, you're competing for this many times and you're, you're not winning. Like, why are you still doing this? And, you know, I thought they were crazy at that moment. Little did I know that would be me. But and it was six times until you won, correct? Was it six times until you won? Six Five? times. Yeah. Six I times. trained for eight years total, but I actually won on my sixth time competing. And you know, like you said, getting turned down and then having to come back and do better the next year, that was the biggest thing in that perseverance because every single year I had to reanalyze after the pageant, be like, okay, who are my coaches right now? Because I can't do this alone. I never have once ever claimed that I did this alone. Number one, my faith, and number two, my family, and number three, my coaches and my mentors. And, you know, when I had my faith in place and I had my family there supporting me 100% of the way, you know, that, that's a lot. That's, that helps a ton. But also my mom didn't know the technique of pageantry. She never competed in a pageant. So I need to hire those people that could help me and invest in myself. And that was the big thing was that, you know, going from basketball was a team sport. Pageantry was individualized. I mean, it was very, it's all individual. And I had to put myself up there to really like, I could be easily embarrassed. I could say the wrong thing. And I have said really dumb answers to questions that they've asked me and I just had to shake it off like sure I've had I've cried plenty of times after losing because I I hate losing <laughs> I'm a competitor and I love to win but I also know that you're not going to get success without a little bit of failure and learning experiences in between um and I would have never been the title holder that I was if I didn't you know get knocked down and heard those no's every time but I I gotta say every single time that I didn't win I use that truly as a learning opportunity to look at and say, okay, I grew a little bit in this area, but 
I need to be honest with myself and I still have a big improvement to do with current events, let's say. And so I would, I would focus on that and I'd say, okay, my runway coach, she's, she's awesome. She's helping me excel. I'm doing great here. I'm going to keep her. But current events, uh, I need the next level of a current event coach, coach because I don't, want, I don't like watching the news. I need somebody to watch the news for me, give me cliff notes, and tell me what they're going to ask me at the pageant. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And I just every single year reanalyzed my coaches and my mentors who were influencing me and helping me. And that just continued to level up my, my game and my confidence. So before we got on, you told me the exact number. Did, did I hear it correct that you hired over the course of 10 years, 22 coaches and mentors? 22 in the 22. past 10 years. So as you're identifying, like you have to be a master at this point of knowing who the right mentors are. And I'm sure some of them served you during the time that you had them. But also I'm, sh- I'm sure there were some experiences where like, man, if I would have asked this question on the front end, I could have sussed out that this wasn't the specific person for this role and I should have gone in a different direction. Did that happen to you at all? You know, there was maybe my first coach or I, I would say my first couple of coaches um, you know, that happened to my, well, my first one. And then my first one in the new state, because with pageantry, there's a list of sponsors and you definitely, um, I thought at the time, if you went with those sponsors, oh, you have a better chance of winning. And, you know, you think you're always going to find these like little loopholes. You work with these people, you work with these, like, it's really not how it works. I mean, that's who they want you to work with because they're on their team. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, who you are as a person. It's not who helped you on the back end as much. Um, but the first coaches, yeah, there were, there were a couple that I was like, ah, maybe I shouldn't have gone with them. But, it, but at the same time, you also learn. And that's just kind of part of the process where you learn that you need to, I always like to find people who have been, you know, where I want to be. And that's who I'm going to hire. Um, and so when I was competing at the state level, um, I hired other title holders who had already been a title holder before. They knew exactly what I was going through emotionally and, you know, physically too on stage. And so, and also resonated with personality wise, like my goal was to win. Like I, if I could have been on a fast track to win, like, yes, I, I definitely um, would have chose that coach, but everybody has perfect timing, right? Like it's all in his timing for me. And it's, um, it's one of those deals. I just had to believe in myself and believe in my mentors and coaches that they were providing me with the, the correct uh, material to get me to where I wanted to go. And I like to match my energy level with the coaches too. That's another thing. If, you know, any of you listening are wanting a mentor, you know, it's really important to see what, what their energy is. Like, where, where do they see you going? Like, where have they gone? Do they have a very ambitious, you know, outlook and think audaciously? Because that's who I need to be paired with is somebody who's thinking way outside the box, box wants to go way further and pushes me to think even a few steps further than I already am. Um, and so when you're looking for a mentor, that's what I'd really suggest is find somebody who is the same level of thinking of you or like thinking bigger than you. Yeah. And who can maybe see that potential in you and has been there before. When I think about the women who listen to this show and even in my early, early days of my career, what I really struggled with was I, I identified people that I looked up to and who had the stats in the area that I wanted to be in. But what I struggled with was thinking that, okay, if I'm picking her as a mentor, she has to be my mentor in all areas. So I'm going to look at her family life. I'm going to look at her work life. I'm going to look at her love life. And I really thought that I had to find the perfect person. And I was on this quest constantly to find the perfect person who had similar circumstances to me, who were who was dealing with similar things that I was dealing with. And what I realized is my story, my background is unique. Therefore, I'm not going to find somebody who has everything that I'm looking for, but I can pinpoint with a variety of mentors who I need to look at because they have stats in their area and then I can specifically learn from them about that one thing and then look at somebody else for this other thing. It sounds like pageantry is the same way where you're looking at stats in their ability to do runway or you also mentioned in current events. So as you're looking at stats for people, do you do online research? Like, How do you really know that somebody has the stats in the area that you're looking to be mentored by? Yeah, it's funny that you actually just mentioned that because I was talking to one of my coaching clients yesterday and I was telling her, you know, she's competing actually for Miss Missouri this coming year, whenever that may be, but she'll be competing for Miss Missouri. And so I told her, you know, I'm a mindset and confidence coach, but I will tell you, I'm not your girl if you want me to coach you on current events. I am not your girl if you want me to teach you how to do runway. 
Could I? Because I've had that experience and also going to Miss USA and competing at Miss USA. I absolutely know the skills now to help you, but that's not my expertise. And so I think you made a really, really good point there, Natalie, is when you're looking for a mentor, find somebody who's, you know, an expert in that industry and find somebody who really specializes in what you need. They don't need to be the full, full circle, um, you know, all in one sort of coach. When it comes to confidence building, I know one of the sayings is fake it until you make it. And some people love the idea of that and other people don't subscribe to that. When you hear fake it till you'll make it as a confidence booster, what are your initial thoughts and perspective? <laughs> it's really funny you say that. I wrote that down on my paper, no joke, because when I was in high school, I used to say fake it till you make it, you know, with confidence. And it was my, my dad always taught and my mom, but my dad really, really drilled it into our head to be extremely humble, never to brag. And so if I came home one day from practice, I was like, heck, I just won the three point, you know, record, like shot, whatever it is, like three point competition. Um, he's like, okay, don't get too cocky now. And he would say it very sarcastic, um, but there was a little truth behind it. And so growing up, my brother and I, you know, he was one, one grade ahead of me. And we always said, fake it till you make it with confidence, because we always say it's really, we couldn't find that balance in high school of how to be humble, but yet confident. So we just stuck to the humble side and we faked it till we made it with the confidence. And then once I got into pageantry, you know, I still kind of said that jokingly. And then I stopped because now I believe, you know, don't fake it till you make it. Like, let's be real. Let's be authentic. Like I, I always said, you can't, if you fake who you are right now in this moment, then you're going to have to continue faking it the more successful you become. And that was really true when it came to pageantry, because if you, were faking it at the state level and you won and you were faking being that person and your confidence level, oh boy, what's going to happen when you go to nationals and you go to, you know, you're out live on Fox at Miss USA and you have to walk down that runway like a Victoria's Secret, mom, you know, like show. It was like, you can't do it. You just, you mentally won't be able to. So um, now I, I totally view fake it till you make it completely differently than I did in high school. It's a balance, right? Where when you initially start out, I don't think, I mean, you know, maybe it's just me. I was not born with confidence. I do not feel like I came out of the womb with the ability to articulate my thoughts or to talk to people. I mean, even up until a few years ago, I struggled with communicating my ideas. And so this idea of if you're not supposed to fake it till you're make, you make it, but you're still supposed to get out there and do it anyway, there's this, there's this interesting balance that people, especially starting out, have to find between still getting enough nerve to do the thing and to demonstrate their skill while not pretending like they're somebody that they're not. Yeah, and along those lines, I, I totally agree. You have to at least, in a sense, fake it to a point that you're confident. Like, you just have to do the thing right? You just was talking to a friend yesterday about doing videos and, or uh, his podcast as well. And he wants to do zoom and podcasts and everything. And I said, you know what? You just got to do it. And I know you're not confident in it right now, but you know, there's always, especially if you're, you're a uh, perfectionist, you always want it to be perfect. And you sometimes just have to do it and just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. If you go back and look at my interviews that I posted that are from last year, um, on my YouTube channel. Oh my gosh. Like horrendous. Like I look at those video interviews and it's embarrassing. I'm like, Oh my gosh, did I actually do that? But I, but I knew they weren't perfect then. I knew they weren't. And I knew someday I would look back and be like, Oh wow, that's, that's pretty bad. But you have to fake it in a sense, you know, you have to get that courage and then you just keep doing it and repetition and repetition and repetition gives you the confidence. I remember reading this quote once where this woman is very big on just starting messy and you just have to go for it. You have to push forward. And her, the counter to starting messy was if it is perfect by the time you started, you started too late. Like you've missed so much time because you were working on perfect. And for many of us, it never is perfect until it, you just you even iterate. I was talking to Will, one of um, our amazing uh, team members, and he was saying, you know, Sometimes you wish that you could go back and make all of it look the way that it is now, but it's so cool to be able to look back and to point back to old YouTube videos and think, wow, think of how far I came because just a year ago, I've made so much movement from then until now. But when it comes to your ability to articulate yourself, even over the last year, what are some things that you've done to 
improve your skills and to come across, I mean, most people watching you or listening to you, you are so articulate. You come across in such a strong professional and charismatic way, but they probably haven't seen a lot of the work that you've put in on the back end to get to this point. Yeah, it's, it's a lot on the back end, you know, and you see, especially now with social media, it's, it's all we see and it's everybody's, it's their true highlight reel. And that's, I try to make it on social media, at least my stories, maybe not my post on my page, but at least my stories a little bit behind the scenes of my life and what I do and without a full face of makeup on and the hair done, because I am a real person. I do struggle with the same things that everybody else does with, you know, most of the time overwhelm. And that's, you know, a thing where just because somebody's an expert in something, they're, you know, an expert like me with mindset and confidence, that doesn't mean that I don't ever have doubts or I don't ever have fears. I don't ever have overwhelm. Like I do constantly, but I just don't let it consume me and I don't let it take a hold of me. Um, I've just, big thing for me is my morning routines. Um, that's what really keeps my mindset on track and reading my scriptures and devotionals, writing down my gratitude and my aunt. I am what I am statements is what I call it with my clients, um, writing your goals out as if they've already happened, your big audacious goals. Um, and so those things keep me on track, but yeah, you know, behind the scenes, it's, I was actually in an extremely toxic relationship, um, less than a year ago. And before I moved to Scottsdale and I, I got out of that relationship, it was a two year relationship. It was a really, really tough time in my life. You know, I was Miss Missouri and I, I was faking <laughs> really faking it till I made it because I, my confidence was so down and, you know, every single day I'd put on my crown and I'd put on my sash and I'd walk out that door with a smile on my face. And I would, you know, be talking to people and pretending like nothing was wrong. And then I would go back home and it was just, it was bad and it was really destroying my confidence. And I would cry every single day, no joke, every single day for the past two years. Um, but I would fight through it and I would fight through it. And in this point in time, um, part of that time I had started my company and I was spinning my wheels when I started my company. I couldn't, because I was surrounded by an unhealthy relationship and um, it goes to show who you surround yourself with really, really determines the outlook, outlook of your future as well. Um, and a lot of people don't know that about me, that I was in that relationship that was draining my energy, draining my confidence. I became super insecure all of a sudden. And it was like, who the heck is this girl? But then I would go out on the Miss USA stage and nobody had a clue because I put a smile on my face. And that's for a lot of people. Like you see their highlight reel on social media, but you don't see the behind the scenes. And, you know, someday I'll talk more about that and probably develop a digital course for girls about relationships and, and those situations um, because I'm so passionate about it, but I'm not to the point yet um, of where that course is going to come to fruition. But once I got out of that unhealthy situation, it has been breakthrough. Hence the name of my podcast, it's breakthrough time because it literally was the second that I was out of that, I was like, all right, Tori, it's game time. You're out of this. It's really, really hard. And you know, a big thing is too, is I go to therapy. I'm pro counseling. I'm pro talking to somebody because there's a lot going on in our world at all times, especially now with you know, these situations that we're in with, with uh, quarantine just getting over and everything. I'm pro talking to somebody. I don't think it's a failure at all if you go and talk to a professional. Um, I've done that and I, I try to keep up with that as much as I can just to keep my mindset up and my health, my, my health up. Um, and then I, yeah, journal a lot, gratitude's a ton. And I just keep, you know, my support system, again, my family is always there for me um, and my faith. Number one, first and foremost, I couldn't, I couldn't do it without that either. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my, the behind the scenes of what has happened and how I've broke through and I just keep pushing. I, I read and I continually, continually invest in myself. There's never one time that I go without having a mentor or a coach right beside me, um, pushing me to do bigger and, and greater things too. So investing in yourself is the number one thing for all of you women listening, invest in yourself because that's the best thing that you can ever invest in. I love your transparency. I think that it's so easy for people, especially to look at you. I mean, again, you are absolutely stunning and you are articulate. And for most people, they aspire to be able to come across the way that you come across and have the achievements that you have at such a young age. Uh, but what they don't see necessarily is the back stuff. It is how hard it is to show up in those moments, how I'm sure it's challenging to be scrutinized by people in the particular environment that you are in. Uh, but then also with your relationship, relationships are such a huge factor of how 
confident we can be. And I know that for from my personal experience, as soon as you cut off those relationships that are in any way toxic or just they don't even have to be toxic as much as they can just be not pushing you forward, your confidence is absolutely impacted by it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Every step of the way. And you need somebody alongside you that is, you know, supporting your success and pushing you to do better things. And when you have, you know, a wild idea to do something bigger and greater, it's like, okay, cool. How can we make this happen? If that's what you want to do, if that's what's in your heart, um, I think it's so important to have a, a partner, you know, in that with you that even, you know, can help you get to that next level. And so, yeah, it is, it's really important. And that goes with your friends, your circle of friends too. It's really important that you surround yourself with people who are true, who are authentic and, you know, will be your biggest cheerleader and you be their biggest cheerleader as well. For sure. Figuring out a way to be supportive and truly supportive is something that, uh, I think people like, I guess we're not really taught how to be supportive. I think people, when I look at the people in my life and the people in, for the businesses that we work with, it, it almost feels like people who are successful have this feeling of like, I did it despite all of these people. And when I look in the world, I don't, I don't think that people are intentionally not supportive. I just think that they don't know how to be supportive. They don't know when you do put yourself out there, what it looks like to be a really good friend or to push somebody. And that's likely a lot of work internally that they aren't even, you know, recognizing that they maybe haven't put in. But as somebody who is pushing themselves, it's hard to be around people that aren't right there next to you doing the things that all you need is like a congratulations or a thumbs up, but instead the silence the silence feels like it's not supportive and that can also decrease your overall confidence in the direction that you're taking things because it's uncertain to you. It's uncertain to anybody who's starting something new as to, you know, where it's ultimately going to go and all you're looking for is people next to you to say, you can do this, you've got this, I'm here for you, whatever you need, I'll share your stuff, I'll I'll promote you because I'm all in with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that actually was another thing that pageantry taught me was you know, how, how to realize like everything happens in the perfect timing and it's not always our timing. You can put in all the work and all the work and then get first runner up. <laughs> and that is the hardest thing in the world is to, you know, it's, it's to be like, wow, okay. I got so close to getting this, but I haven't quite gotten it yet. How can I go one step further? Um, but knowing that there is enough in this world to go around to everybody and when you realize that and you don't let the jealousy and the envy and seeing somebody else's success take a hold of you and you're just behind them and support them and hey way to go congratulations like this is not and we're all in this together you know like this life isn't a warm-up and so everybody's just trying to do their best all the time and just knowing and getting to the point in life where you know that there's just there's enough to go around in this world um it's just a really healthy place to to be i love that Tori, where can people find you? I have loved this conversation. I am so excited that we've now connected again, not just at the event for people who don't know. I actually, we ran into each other randomly at a convention that we were at just a few months ago. Uh, and we ran into each other in the elevator, like the, the elevator bank. Uh, and we talked and then, you know, a few months later, here we are on this podcast. But for people who want to connect with you, they want to listen to your podcast and check out the programs that you have, where can you direct them? Yes, absolutely. So my, all my social media is at Miss Tori Cruz. And then my website is highlightsandheels.com. And that's highlights, the letter N, heels.com. And you can click the link in my bio on my Instagram to check out my podcast, which is on, you know, Apple, iTunes, um, Spotify, Google, all the major platforms. And then I also have a positive mindset course um, on there too that you can check out. But I would love, Natalie, to give all of your listeners um, they, the free download for my Breakthrough Blueprint. If you enjoyed what you heard, just go to the link in my bio it, at Miss Tori Cruz. The very first link, you just click on that, and it's a free Breakthrough Blueprint download. And you can start you know, getting clarity and confidence and then consistency with your goals. So your mindset and confidence just levels up, and you can start breaking through challenges. Guys, you have to do it because I want confidence like her. Like I, if, if I could have had access to this in moments when I was lacking confidence, I am certain that it would have absolutely helped me have the breakthrough that I was looking for. Tori, thank you for being a guest. And I look forward to seeing you in person, hugging you in person when all of this quarantine stuff is fully lifted. Yes, I can't wait. Thank you so much for having me on, Natalie, and keep inspiring women. I'm, I love what you're doing.
Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that episode. I would love to hear from you in the comments below. Also, please follow me on social media at Miss Tori Cruz. Until next time, be unstoppable.